person is somebody that we're very, very lucky to have here. Um, this is Anthony Parkanis, and I first met Anthony at a Skeptic Cal lecture in uh, Berkeley or Oakland. They, they moved their date, they moved their locations years and years ago, and I was so impressed with him. I said to myself, wow, why didn't I know this man sooner? This guy is really, really interesting. He's an expert uh, witness for a lot of different um, court cases, and I don't know what he's going to be talking about, but it should be very interesting. Um, and one of the things that you guys can do if you want more information is you can look up their Wikipedia pages. Uh, some people may know that I run a Wikipedia editing team, the Girl of Skeptics, you'll see our logos in different places. And Anthony's Wikipedia page is one of those that we have rewritten, and it is, as far as I know, it's still in great, amazing shape. So, come on up, Anthony. Thank you, Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. so I'm pretty loud. Loud. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not up there. So I just raised the light on this. I think we're good. Uh, thank you, Susan, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, the uh, work of you and your colleagues, uh, some of the best things going in Skeptics. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I appreciate it and admire it. Um, let me give you a little background. We're going to talk about the projection tactic. Before we begin, I want to give you just a little background about where this idea is coming from. It's roughly since high school, uh, maybe before that, I've been fascinated by one question. Why would somebody do or believe such a thing? And, and it just kept popping up. And roughly around the middle of my high, uh, college career, I stumbled into an area of flim flam and understand the influence that's going on, such as, for instance, with fraud criminal on the telephone, and understand how it operates and works. Uh, for those of you who are interested in that, there was a Skeptical Inquirer article I did on how to sell a pseudoscience, which lists some of the common tactics that are used. I also have a chapter, which I'm revising, called Why We, do, uh, Why we Believe Crazy Things, and a book that you can get online, a videotape. If you type in Weapons of Fraud, AARP, you'll see these tactics that are used by far criminals. So that's like a social influence analysis where you look at intact influence to see what's going on. Today I want to do something different. I want to just take one influence tactic that's oftentimes used with flim flam and explore it in detail. And that tactic is the projection tactic. Here's how it works. Someone accuses another person of the misdeeds, wrongdoings, terrible traits that they themselves are doing and possess. In other words, a person, let's say, who would as a liar, accuses someone else of being a liar. Now this produces two interpersonal effects. First of all, the target of this projection is usually seen as guilty. Something's wrong with them. They're guilty of the misdeed. On the other hand, the projectionist, the person who's doing the accusation, comes clean. They're seen as innocent and off the hook. I'll give you the experiments that we did to show how this works in just a minute. An example of this, and this is one of the two uh, examples that, uh, two cases that have inspired me to do this research with Derek Rucker, I'll tell you about in a minute, was when Hitler invaded Poland in 1939. Before the invasion and after the invasion, he accused the Poles of being aggressive. There was a, it was all captured in a, a propaganda fam, uh, film called Campaign in Poland. And in this uh, video, the Poles are accused of terrorizing German citizens in Gdansk, refusing to negotiate with Hitler clearly unreasonably, creating German refugees, engaging in aggressive attacks on Germans, and torturing German soldiers. None of that was true. In addition, Hitler noted that the media just will not cover these atrocities by the Pole because of a pro-Pole bias. 
And that enemies are hiding in civilian clothes, namely because they were civilians. <laughs> That's the projection tactic in action. Hitler is engaged in aggressive activity invading Poland, Czechoslovakia, and so forth, and he accuses the other the people who he's invading of having those aggressive tendencies. Um, this, was, this tactic was first noted by Ellis Freeman in Conquering the Man in the Street about Nazi propaganda. He didn't use this example, he used others. So what I want to do is, to, in our time together, is I'll give you uh, a little bit about the research on projection, the experiments we did to uncover this and how it worked. Then we'll look at you know, what kind of social processes are engaged when this happens. I'll give you more examples than we can possibly go through. <laughs> and then uh, I get to ask the questions. Huh. Oh, what's a skeptic to do once we know this knowledge? And if I was listening to this talk, I'd be really interested in the first part. And then I'll say, man, the guy ended it on a low note. Because <laughs> I don't know what to do. So let's go through the experimental evidence. This comes from a study I did with Derek Rucker, who's now a professor at Northwestern. And it was called Projection as Interpersonal Influence Tactics, the Effects of the Pot Calling the Kettle Black. Notice I'm emphasizing the word interpersonal. Freud used projection, meaning you know, some psychodynamics. I don't care where the, 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 that comes from. What I'm interested in is when I accuse somebody of doing my misdeed, what happens interpersonally? So we did a set of four experiments. The first two used, uh, uh, students came in and they watched a videotape. In this videotape, there were three players playing a prisoner's dilemma game. You know how prisoner dilemma games work. We both cooperate, we both get points. If we both defect, we get hardly any points. But if I defect and you cooperate, I get lots of points. And what we did is we had 12, they would play 12 rounds, these three people, and they would hold up a, an angel or a devil, depending on whether they're cooperating or not. And all the, all the, all the participants are cooperating. Midway through, the players uh, find out that uh, one person has a huge amount of points and the others do not. It's clear that one person is cheating, one person is lying. Now in half the cases, one of the players, player B, when they find out this information that somebody's cheating, he says, that means one of us is, is competing. Which one of you are lying? In other words, the projection tactic. And then we had at the end with well, this videotape that he did that twice at the sixth round and the twelfth round. At the end of the videotape, uh, students did some ratings, including a measure of how honest the players were, how competitive they were. In other words, who was the blame for this lie? Does it make sense? So, what's the results? The results show this is the, the players here. And um, this is when they, there's no projection at all. And you can see that player B is seen as suspicious. Uh, player A happened to be Derek's uh, fiance, and she always looked down, so everybody thought she was suspicious. Uh, suspicious. But anyway, what happened was, as soon as player B does the projection, he's seen as innocent. And the other players are seen as more guilty. That interaction is significant. The second study is, after we prove that, I sat there and said, well, how do we stop this thing? Suppose we load the box, we make player B look suspicious as possible. What would happen? So we did the same exact experiment again, we wanted to replicate it. God knows we should be doing more of that <laughs> in social sciences. And this time, the subjects before they watched the videotapes got a questionnaire supposedly filled out by players A, B, and C. And in this questionnaire, player B made it clear, I'm going to win this game at all costs. I'm going for the juggler. In other words, they're out, they're out to win at any cost. So what do you have? In the low suspicion, that would replicate the previous studies, you get the same exact results. The objection works. Uh, <laughs> the other two players are seen as more guilty. However, when you raise suspicion high, yeah, the, guy, the player B does look suspicious. You're getting a main an effect for that, but their projection is still working, even though everybody's suspicious. 
We wanted to then put this in new domains. This is basically the Hitler experiment. Subjects read about a conflict between two countries, Clairvonia, the projectionist, and Pangeria, the target. Uh, we had independent variables where on uh, the projection, Clairvonia would hold a press conference before they invaded Pangeria, and they accused Pangeria of preparing for an attack ready to assault us. And then we had another variable. We wanted to turn this thing off to stop it. And so we had news reports saying that Clairvonia was responsible for the attack. This is a two by two of the design. The defendant, the defendant of airports, who's responsible? Participants were more likely to blame Pangeria when Clairvonia accused Pangeria of war. And while uh, the news media, you get a, the same kind of main effect that you got before, the, the news media makes uh, uh, Clairvonia look more guilty, the projection tactics still worked. So you're better off if you're trying to get rid of, do, avoid a misty, making sure you accuse other people what you're doing. The final experiment, which will have a surprise dependent variable at the end, tested it, uh, uh, did a cheating scenario. So students are reading about a study group the night before a, a, a test, a student named Brock. Uh, Mike actually gets copies of the exam and hands it out to the study group. Some of the students throw it in the trash, others leave with it, including Jack, our projectionist. After grading the exam, the teacher was surprised at how well students did and informs the class, hey, I think somebody's cheating here. The independent variables are Jack tells the uh, teacher about the distributed exams, in other words, projection. Look how the people were cheating. And it's very clear from his test scores, he went from like a C to an A on this test. Very clear he got, he was part of it. And he gives it before or after the teacher becomes suspicious. That variable doesn't mean much either. And then the likelihood of Jack cheating, the test sneakers, the ones who left with the exam, and the other students. Here's the results. So people see Jack is guilty, sure. But as soon as he does the projection, it doesn't matter if it's before or after the teacher gets suspicious, he's seen as more innocent. In addition, the other students go up. Even those that didn't even have the exam are starting to stay at about a point one level, so that's significant. But they're even starting to be seen as guilty. Here's the surprise. The last question on the questionnaire actually ask and assess people's naive understanding of projection. After all, we all know, you know, the story of the sister, Beth, who accuses Rachel of stealing the cookie when Beth stole it. We all know those kind of things. So we have a thing, Mike, the guy who handed out the test, fears that the teacher may discover that he stole the test. To avoid suspicion, he tells that the teacher that other students were cheating on the test. Do you think this would make the teacher more or less suspicious of Mike? And the answer is 76% said more suspicious of Mike. In other words, they're seeing through the projection tactic that they just fell for less than three questions earlier. That's the way it is with a lot of influence. People recognize the tactics, and if it's happening to somebody else, I can point it out. But if it's happened to me, it's difficult. Now, how does it work? These are four basic uh, principles, four basic social behaviors that get engaged. The first is that we're accused by him of harassing him, of lying. He even went so far to take the uh, Department of Justice prosecutor, Ross Goldstein, and accuse him of lying and not being the real government. He was part of that uh, posse commentat stuff. You know, that, uh, the, the good news on this is he's now in prison for 12 years. It also shows up in con criminals. The uh, Sophie Smith, the con criminal who used to run the shell game and a, smoke, a soap scam out of Denver, he would uh, warn, his gang would warn newcomers to Denver and later Skagway about confidence games. You don't want to fall for them. 
the other people were out to get you, and then he would, they would get steered to a confidence game. Uh, he would then accuse anybody who accused him of crime that you're the guy that you did it. Uh, and he also, anybody who brought reformers in, he would accuse them of making money. There's more of them. We can go through them if you like. We can do it during the break. Here's one that's really interesting. Uh, if you haven't read uh, Charles Shepard's Forgiven, uh, I recommend it. It's the story of the PTL Club and Reverend Jim Baker. What Jim Baker would do is siphon off funds for his own use from the PTL group. There were accountants and finance people who tried to prevent this. They were actually meaning, they actually thought Christianity was about feeding the poor and they were upset about this. What Baker would then do is ignore them, siphon off the money, and then accuse them oh. of the crime. They would get fired and they would leave. And then he would go on air talking about this and saying, look, I've been victimized this by these folks. Please send in more money. <laughs> the interesting one on this is seeing it the same organization over time, about a 10 year, 15 year period. As you get rid of moral people that are standing up, the organization becomes more and more corrupt. He did the same thing with the Charlotte Observer, who started to follow up on the financial fraud and sexual affairs. Accused them and the government of trying to destroy Christianity. Here's a list of international affairs, uh, same kind of thing. <laughs> um, for those of you who love literature, Othello and Silas Warner are based on the projection tactic. Othello accuses Desdemona of being unfaithful as he is unfaithful. Silas Warner leaves the Christian community that he was brought up in, becomes super bitter until he has that ado adopted daughter because he's accused of a crime falsely by the person who committed it. That's the basis of those two novels, is the projection tactic. And for those of you who like cartoons, I've decided to become more aggressive in blaming others for my lack of success, says Wally. For example, you're keeping me from working right now. Dobert says, no, I'm not. I don't have time to stand here and argue with you all day. <laughs> and for those in business, you have many benefits after our technology is irrevocably implemented in your network. For example, when our products stop working, we'll blame another vendor within 24 hours. Uh, the point of your boss is, do you have free t-shirts? <laughs> so what's a skeptic to do? Wait, what, what did the devil say? The uh, devil said, uh, yeah, and they're fully equipped with allergens. <coughs> Things that produce allergens. <laughs> so what's a skeptic to do? First of all, here's the rub. Fact checking is hard. Especially in real time. People are poor at lie detection. They think they're good at it. Oh, let's see, let's just shift the eye. But they're not. When people can't figure out the truth, they use heuristics. Like, I've heard that over and over again. It must be true. It agrees with what my point of view. It must be true. If it's a social identity, it must be true. And in, the, in many cases, when people find out that somebody's lying, there's a real reluctance to expose liars. I'll tell you some experiments on that if you want. That's what makes it so hard. The second thing is, is there is some, and notice some and those certain words are bold and italicized because it's not a given. Without knowing where the truth is, you don't know exactly what's going on. And the truth in these cases are hard to find out. So you might, uh, you, so, so there's some information value when you hear projections, like accusations. It could be a cue, it could, it could be used as a cue that, hey, maybe there's some deception going on here. This guy's trying to pull something over me. Projection may also give you some inadvertent signals into their intentions. Why are they attacking that particular person in that particular way? They're usually, these things come from um, two things. They want to divert attention away from something, so I'm invading Poland, so I want to accuse them. Or they may be their own personality traits. If I'm corrupt in a certain way, I assume everybody else is corrupt in that way. And so they project that on. The other flip side of that is that someone who's a target of projection may exactly be doing something right. Instead of believing that he or she is evil, it may be doing something right. Like James Randi, when he gets attacked, is doing something right. Basically, if you're not getting attacked, 
you probably aren't doing anything. Right. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Um, this slide is really message dense. If I was a political consultant and you asked me how do I deal with this, the typical way is a technique called damn it, refute it, damn it, replace it. You know, that thing's wrong, here's why it's wrong, that thing's wrong, and here's what's really happening. That's the technique for dealing with this kind of rumor and innuendo. This goes back to World War II rumor transmission, stopping rumor transmission by Gordon Alcord. It's basically of no value. Uh, because the original projection takes on a life of its own. Then what happens is, you, you oftentimes, especially on social media, you can't reach the people who got the projection. You know, everybody's in those little networks. It doesn't work. Plus, the effective pro uh, projection is just going to flood the media with accusations. You've got 11 a day coming out of one organization, and you can't deal with 11 a day. And the projectionists can then use DRDR uh, -DR <laughs> to basically get rid of the projection. These are the other responses, legal responses. Uh, but they're hard. Since New York Times versus Sullivan, it's been really hard to prove libel and slander in U.S. courts. You have to prove malicious intent. That's a hard thing to do. Same thing with fraud. You have to prove that it's intent to fraud. That's a really hard thing to do. That's why they had me in testifying on Larry Lytle to explain how this works. Plus, those with resources can file nuisance lawsuits. So if I'm a really rich projectionist, I can nail you. Not me. And with Larry Lytle, he went through 20 years, 25 years of legal FDA doing this, FDA doing this. And it, it didn't do any good. I mean, he, he worked from roughly up until 80. The only ones that do work, and these are hard, is to create norms in our society to buffer us from this projection tactic. There's an old-fashioned notion, innocent until proven guilty. Know the facts before you emote and believe. And classic humanist, humanism, think that you might be wrong. There are times you're going to have to take action, you know, invade a country or whatever. But temper that with the notion that you might be wrong. And on that, I'll leave you with my favorite propaganda poster from the Roosevelt era. <laughs> Could you imagine? This is a WPA uh, work project poster. Know the facts <laughs> during the Great Depression. I think I went too long, Susan. I thought it was great. <laughs> Did you? We have somebody. Let's ask one question. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Talk to me. I don't think we should. That's all right. <laughs> And keep in mind that Anthony will be here later so that we can we can ask him questions as we um, have time. Hi, I'm a retired legal secretary, so I'm kind of interested in the law. Um, with part of the recent large jury award against Monsanto, right. I was wondering how you would handle that as an expert for Monsanto, how you might try to debunk the unscientific or lack of scientific evidence for climate Yeah, I think um, well, that's the interesting part. Um, I don't know enough about that case to give an exact uh, uh, phrase. What I would do is, there's two courts, court of public opinion and the legal court. In the legal court, you have your experts and so forth come in, and you know you would have uh, explanations to the jury on how they're being persuaded, what the standards are. The court of public opinion, I think what my talk does is raise the question, how in the hell do we deal with it? I mean, this is rampant. Social media has made it more rampant than before, and it's just live, boom, 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 boom. And you just can't, by the time you debunk one, there's more than 29,000. And that's the real, that's why I went with the norm approaches. I don't think that's a very good answer. <laughs> I, would, I would not only, I, would, I wouldn't be impressed with that. I, I, I feel like the anti GMO propaganda machine is really, really good right. for marketing. I know it is. Yeah, every box has a non-GMO now. Yeah. Hi, my name is Steve from Pacific Grove now. Sure. And 
want to highly recommend one of my favorite films that deals with projection, Billy Wilder's masterpiece, Dollar Mark 17. Okay. I, I will put that on the list. Right. And I have a question about academic freedom for you. If you were to give part of a lecture at UC Santa Cruz dealing with Trump and his mentor, Rick Cohen, do you think too many of your students would complain to your dean, conservative students? Well, actually, the left wing could complain more about me at Santa Cruz than the right wing. Because when I give a talk like this, notice I didn't mention Trump. Um, when, I, when, I give, <laughs> when I give a talk like this, I make sure that I'm balanced. And that I give, uh, this is to this audience, and you want skeptic examples, but if I was going to give political examples, you, you would have had both right-wing and left-wing examples. 